Hello, how are you? <laughs> Hi, uh, Amy West. Hi, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Uh, excellent. Uh, let me just tell the audience that this is Glenn Lowry, that we are at uh, The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, and that uh, today my guest is Professor Amy Wax, who is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. So welcome to The Glenn Show, Amy. Thank you. Nice I should be here. Thank you. I should say welcome back because we had a conversation just, I don't know, two weeks ago, 10 days ago or something like that. And this is part two of that conversation. And the conversation was about you, Amy, <laughs> and your ideas uh, because you're wonderful, because you're controversial. Um, and uh, people can tune in to last, uh, the last episode of The Glenn Show and hear something about the controversy engendered by an article of yours talking about um, the value of uh, uh, bourgeois uh, values uh, that one associates with the 1950s for families struggling with poverty. And um, I wanted to uh, carry on that conversation uh, because it has implications for a large number of areas of public policy, including educational policy, and I thought we might talk about that explicitly. But before we do, I wanted to ask you for an update. What's been going on in your world at the University of Pennsylvania, where colleagues are calling for your head on a platter, where students I gather are upset, um, and where you have become, you know, a, uh, a figure of uh, some notoriety? I'm just curious how things are going. Well, what's, what's truly interesting is that nothing has been going on. There was... Um, a letter signed by some of my colleagues, uh, categorically rejecting all my claims, condemning me, no reasons were given, no argument was given, uh, no rationale was given, uh, nothing to the substance of what I said. Uh, and then there was a call to students to report if in any way, shape or form uh, their the values of diversity or non-stereotyping, I'm not even sure what the language was, are somehow being compromised, and, and that's it. Uh, and then there's been a lot of immediate attention. The comments on that letter by the faculty were scathing. As I said in a recent interview, the theme was, mothers don't let your children grow up to go to Penn Law School. Uh, if these professors can't even make an argument What's the point? Yeah, Why I saw that. Here? Yes. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and I've been giving a bunch of interviews. None of my colleagues, save one, uh, who did write a little bit of a merits rebuttal on the Heterodox Academy website, have mm -hmm. even come to talk to me, have offered me any explanation. Uh, no one has. Uh, I, I've really had radio silence. Uh, some of the people who didn't sign the letter have talked to me to express their dismay or their support, but none of the people who have signed the letter uh, have really spoken to me at all. Uh, the person who instigated the letter has said that he's going to write some kind of rebuttal and post it. He, he sent a draft a month later, uh, but that's it. It hasn't been posted. Posted. I haven't seen it. Uh, so that's that's what's going on. Uh, and as I said earlier, I, I am going to give an address to the law school, to the students in a few weeks to talk about my experience and what I think the implications are for them and for recent discourse on campus. And my conclusion is going to be uh, the implications are dire. I have tenure and there were calls to remove me from teaching. There were calls... There were calls from the central campus to uh, retaliate against me in all sorts of ways. My dean, to his credit, resisted them. But, of course, students have no such protections. Non-tenured instructors, no, instructors have no such protections. So if someone decided to call them out for something and put it past them, why not? Uh, they'd be vulnerable to real penalties including, as many students have told me, possible loss of a job offer or employment. They're terrified of that. They are afraid of that. Constant their normies and stick to the script and don't say anything that might stir the ire 
of faculty members or fellow students, they'll be okay. They need to keep their head down. And I think that's a sad thing, Glenn. I, I really see academia as veering towards complete bankruptcy. Let me ask you something now. Uh, among the things that uh, you have said that are controversial is not all cultures are equal. If in terms of equality, we think about their functional effectiveness at producing people who can prosper and succeed in modern society. Uh, you also say that there is, if you look at ethnic minorities, blacks in particular, and you compare them to um, other uh, groups in society, whites is a very broad label, but middle class white families might be um, a, uh, a fair characterization of the counterpoint here, uh, that uh, just as a, as a statistical matter, uh, the uh, embrace of these uh, positive values that you affirm is less frequently seen amongst blacks. So there's a, you put a racial and a cultural element on it. Um, I think that many people might be willing to concede the point that uh, not all behavioral patterns and systems of value are the same, but would chafe at the idea that you would identify uh, the positive values with uh, one racial group and the negative with another just on the fact that the frequency of the embrace of those values is higher than one group or another. Do you see what I'm getting at? They would say it's yes, not a racial thing. Yes, but in the op-ed, we didn't do that. We called ah. out you know, a lot of different uh, segments of society or sort of subcultures of society as uh, not necessarily exemplifying the most functional values, and it included increasingly, unfortunately, lower class populations who are... Um, you know, abusing drugs and, and are less involved in the labor market. I'm talking about that. Uh, increased idleness, uh, increased out of wedlock childbearing. Uh, so it's not just a racial thing. In the op-ed, uh, we did not single out one race, not by any means. That That is a misrepresentation of what we said. Okay, that's a, I think that's a really important um, point to establish. I think that's a, a bum wrap. That's a bummer out. Uh, however, uh, you know, I did. We did historically speak about the fifties culture uh, as exemplifying these values to a higher degree, at least on the surface, and the way people behaved and conformed to them. Without denying that there are Bohemians in every society, there are people in every society who do deviate, and maybe that's healthy to some extent. I think the point is, Glenn, that it can't be the main event. We can't hold society together if that kind of um, sort of bohemian deviation from those that solid script becomes too dominant. And, and that was something that we also said uh, in that. Um, so, you know, we can talk about race if you'd like, and I'm happy to talk about race. Uh, but that was certainly not a centerpiece of the P of the op-ed. Okay, Let, let's not talk about race. Um, I mean, we're going to get to talking about race in due course because we want to talk about affirmative action here. But for right now, let me call your attention to um, controversy because the uh, Department of Education under Betsy DeVos has announced its intention to roll back some of the Title IX sexual um, assault uh, regulations that were imposed during the Obama era on uh, colleges in terms of how they handle sexual assault cases. Now, I raise that because I uh, think it's going to be empirically correct to say that the vast majority of these sexual assault cases that um, get uh, celebrated and uh, become infamous, whether at Stanford or Columbia University or other places, will be involving uh, middle class or upper middle class white kids uh, young right. young men and women who find themselves in a, in a dispute and will have been engendered by sexual behavior that let's just say is not consistent with 1950s Victorian bourgeois values. Okay, there's a lot of promiscuity. That's true. Uh, and will and will be fueled by a lot of alcohol and drunken parties and things of this kind that are also a little bit uh, away from uh, the values that uh, you want and I want to affirm as being consistent with the success in society. Now, these are all at all of these colleges with all of this kerfluffle about sexual harassment, all these lawsuits and these penalties and the books that are being written. And the, these are all middle class, upper middle class white kids. 
Yes, that is true. It's interesting. I think that this is the fallout from abandoning some of the uh, wisdom, some of the norms, some of the understandings about men and women and their relations. Definitely. I think it's been a disaster. Uh, the hookup culture has engendered uh, many, many casualties, Glenn. Uh, you know, it, it's there are pluses and minuses. I think things were maybe too repressive in the 1950s and something had to give, but we, the pendulum has swung wildly in the other direction. And there are a lot of myths and there's a lot of ideology that's informing the way young people behave. I think here's a myth that there is one sexuality and that sexuality is male. Males and females are equally interested and invested in this kind of promiscuous partying, merry-go-round lifestyle. And I think the fact that that is not, in fact, so a lot of distress, psychological distress and sort of Monday morning regret on the part of women. I think the way it comes out is by leveling these allegations because people are very confused about voluntariness, coercion, consent, uh, desired or undesired, wanted and unwanted. Young women are not philosophers, right? So they are taking on some of the, the confusions that uh, feminists are peddling to them. And that's been horrible. But having said that, so far, these young middle-class white kids are hooking up in college. And once they get out, Eventually, they follow the script. White, let's take white college-educated males with a BA. Their chance of getting married over a lifetime is still very high. It's yeah. over 90%. Now, that could change any time. Yeah. Mark Regnerus has just written a book, a really interesting book called Cheap Sex. And he says the numbers are rapidly change rates even among this very married group are plummeting that norm is starting to fail and when it does it's going to be uh, very harmful it's going to be a disaster now it hasn't happened yet uh, they're still shifting gears and following the conventional upper middle class script but it's very fragile it may not last I don't know what will happen I got another kind of question to ask you, Amy. I'm still in the, uh, you know, uh, processing of your notoriety phase of our conversation here tonight, and that's and that's the dangers of the martyr complex. Let me just call it this: dangers of the martyr complex. Now, I know a little something of what I'm talking about personally <laughs> when I talk about dangers of the martyr, and uh, I I think you already know what I'm getting at. But here's here's the thing. You say something that you believe is true and you think is important. Mm -hmm. uh, the usual suspects go ballistic and attack you for having said the thing that you believe to be true and important, but that they don't want to hear. Okay. You get pilloried. You get vilified. You get castigated. You get ostracized. Okay. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. This has happened to me. Now, the danger that I'm trying to identify is that one can become emotionally so... Um, you know, uh, aggrieved by this injury. And it is an injury. This is this doesn't feel good. I don't want to sure, pretend sure. that this feels good. I don't think you would say that. You would much rather be loved than to be despised yeah. and vilified. Um, <laughs> you know, even if people don't agree with you, you would rather be disagreed with agreeably rather than being disagreed with, uh, you know, uh, with people expressing contempt. Well, and Glenn, like, that's over. That's over. Our society doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> Those were the bourgeois values. What can I say? Yeah, but anyway, go on. Well, You're the danger of the martyr, the martyr complex is going to be, you know, I'm this person that everybody hates, and darn it, all I did was speak my mind, and they came on me with a ton of bricks. And you know what? I don't give a damn about them. And 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 and, and by the way, maybe there's something else I can say that'll rile them up. You know what? <laughs> I, I mean, I'd rather am relishing this role of being the the person who is pilloried and vilified and whatever, <laughs> whatever, because I'm a truth teller. Darn it, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm gonna, you know, this kind of thing. And it might affect a person's judgment. It it, it might lead them yeah. to not be yeah, as... Sure. I think you know, everything Yeah. You, you get the idea. Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. And I, I'll have a few things to say about that. I mean, I have really given that a lot of thought because I have been vilified, ostracized, shunned, all blah, blah, blah. Uh, first of all, I said to a couple of students, first of all, the students have been wonderful. 
Wow. I have students who have been uh, so supportive and they have said such intelligent things. And I was talking to a group in the hall and uh, they said, how are you doing? I said, you know, it's not about me. It's not about me. I keep telling myself that it's, it's so much bigger than me, what's going on. And one, one of my students says, yeah, it's about truth, isn't it? It's about being able to try to tell the truth and not having somebody condemn you publicly. I said, yeah, I'd like to think it is about that. about the academic values of having to give reasons and having to justify what you say. You know, as I tell my children, the fact that you have a right to do something doesn't make it the right thing to do. So I think we need to articulate to ourselves, what is the right thing to do? How do we stand on higher ground? As academics, as people who are in the business of trying to figure out what's correct and what's not correct, what's true and what's not true, and we have to keep our eye on the ball of that and never take our eye off. But having said that, of course, it, it is hurtful. It is isolating. You have to be a strong person to deal with this. But I think that's part of the point. I'm pretty insensitive. You know, I'm pretty tough. I think I'm tougher than most, but most people are not. Most people are just normies. I mean, the, the, the impulse, the temptation to just go along and get along, to conform, is they are already guilty of our august institution to pile on and offer, you know, more incentive to go along and get along. I, I don't think that's constructive. Now, in terms of just being provocative to be provocative, well, you know, I, I tend to be, people call me provocative. They say oh, she likes being provocative, but really I don't like being provocative. I just really, really want to figure out what's true. I'm not kidding. I, I don't think that I'm, you know, sort of setting myself up as, as some superior being by saying that I'm just describing myself. I really, my whole life, I've always tried to figure out you know, what's true. And I have a little contrarian impulse. I think I got it from my dad. My dad really was the role of someone who always questioned the received wisdom and always encouraged me to think for myself. Uh, and I, I have taken that from him. But in the current era, it really carries dire consequences. Uh, I think it is important in social settings to be diplomatic, to try and get along. And I've I've tried to learn some of those lessons. I think I've learned them now as I've gotten older. My children have called me out on that and said, "Wow, you don't have to turn every dinner party into you know, some <laughs> kind of political debate. Sometimes it's okay to be boring, Mom. Uh, they, <laughs> and I've taken that point. But when we're with friends, it's different than sure. when we are in our role right, as professors. Right. Uh, but I have learned these lessons. I, I went and saw my dear, dear friend from my undergraduate years at Yale. I've known this woman for many, many years, and we are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. We had a lovely weekend together in upstate New York. Uh, she and her wife, uh, it was, we, we got along fine. I do think there's a value in that. But one, when you're in your professor role, that is a different set of norms. It has to be a different set of norms. You still need to be courteous and be patient and do your homework, right? But we all have to be able to come together and reason together without impugning each other's moral worth. We must do that, or we might as well just go to Wall Street or be yoga instructors, really. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you, Amy. I'm with my first class of my um, first meeting of my class on race and inequality occurred last week. Uh, and I told the kids, the young people in the room, that it was a very rare event, a probability of point zero 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 something, that all 70 of us in the room thought exactly the same things about many of the questions that were going to be very emotional and powerful questions right. that we would be against. And if we couldn't express our differences of opinion in a way that would allow us to engage with one another, we might as well just pack up and go home. What's the point? Uh, you know? I agree. Yeah. It's true because the educational establishment is so expensive. It's, it's so elaborate. 
it, it costs so much money. Look at all the resources we're pouring into it. And it's also a fertile source of inequality in, in the way that it is uh, structured right now. Uh, there was just a Politico piece about this. I certainly don't agree with everything in it, uh, but let's face it. Uh, we've got this plush, well-funded, Ivy selective collegiate yeah. sector. Yeah. Uh, and people just keep pouring money into it. Frankly, Glenn, after this experience, if I had the time, I would start a movement, defund the Ivy League. Oh, really. to get to get just alumni stop. to stop to alumni to stop, stop giving. giving money, please, no, no more. There are people suffering out there, the forgotten man. Think wow. of something else to do with your money. Uh, they have enough. They have more than enough. And they're not using it to a good purpose anymore. I mean, the scientific establishment, yes, is still a wonder of the world and deserves support. But the rest of the university, Glenn, if they can be the worst for it, I'm sorry to say that may sound really I'm being provocative. Well, no, I don't want to give up. I, I don't do, I don't agree with you. I want to keep up. the. I know what you're saying in the humanities and the social sciences. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There is an ideological uh, uh, left-leaning tilt, and uh, and uh, you know uh, a lot of dumb stuff is going on. In my opinion, I, I agree with that, but I don't want to give up. I I want to I want to fight against the the zeitgeist uh, mm -hmm. to the extent that mm -hmm. I can. I hope you I hope you'll stick with it. Um, but but let's talk about was it national <laughs> affairs? Was it I, your you know, was with it. Was it in National Affairs yeah. that your article on education of disadvantaged young people uh, 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 to, uh, appeared? Yes. So uh, I, I, I want I, I want to talk about, about that. that uh, yes, you and have... then I have a longer version. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so tell us uh, what some of your controversial ideas are about educating the disadvantaged, and uh, let's talk about what that might mean for policy um, in the United mm -hmm. States. Right. Well, what I did in that article is I compared two recently popular uh, ideas about how to educate the disadvantaged, uh, which have been pushed in different quarters. One is income integration, uh, which people like Richard Kallenberg and others have been yeah. touting, uh, which is to have these programs at the local level, usually coordinated through school districts, to mix people of different social classes, which, of course, upper middle class being predominantly white, uh, from the lower classes being often minority, not always, but often. So it, it kind of is a shadow method for uh, integrating by race. Um, it's really a substitute for voluntary racial integration, which the Supreme Court said is, is not allowed in the Seattle School District case. And a yeah. number of local school districts have implemented such programs. Uh, but there, uh, as I explained in the article, the, the potential for these programs is limited. I can talk more about that. But the other is these no excuses charter schools, which are a special niche of the charter school movement. The charter school movement is sprawling and vast and it encompasses a lot of different models. But this model is specifically a kind of totalizing model of, uh, inculcating and acculturating the students in these schools, which are demographically predominantly minority, predominantly lower middle class, to middle class values quite self-consciously. This is, middle class mindset. Ex excuse me, this is the KIPP Academy's model that it's, you're talking about? And everything it spawned, Success Academy, there's now yeah. dozens of schools like this, yes. Uh, so I can compare these. And the one thing they have in the article is they're both uplift models. They're both uplift models, but one is a passive uplift model. The idea behind income integration that if you put lower middle class kids who are falling behind academically and maybe come from homes where uh, there isn't as much stability and structure and some of these values are not either modeled or uh, pushed on them, that if you mix them with kids who come from homes that are more stable, more structured, more bourgeois, then the kids will take on the habits and the mindset and the outlook of the uh, better off children. Uh, there's nothing, you don't need to do anything specific. It will just happen by osmosis. Uh, and that's the idea. And then the no excuses model is a much more active model. Uh, it, it 
very self-consciously and funny, inculcates certain habits on the ground, very specific, you know, listen, do your homework, eyes on the teacher, uh, you know, be nice, be on time, follow the rules, a very prescriptive, very, very prescriptive micromanagerial model. And then also on the academic side, uh, a lot of basics and uh, more drill and kill than you would find in your ordinary school. Uh, and it really, I think it's better in some ways because it, I think it works better. Uh, I think it's more feasible. It's less under siege by the progressive forces, uh, which, uh, you know, are very hostile to it on some level, but because their kids don't go there, uh, upper middle class kids don't go there, then there's not sort of an active uh, opposition to it. Um, I favor a kit type model, no excuses model. I, I say about income integration that the problem with income integration, and I use um, some of the writing on income integration, uh, a book called Despite the Best of Intentions, which is very emblematic, is that it starts to subvert from within. There are forces to subvert from within uh, the very upper middle classness of these schools. Why? Because when you bring in students from other backgrounds, stratification immediately occurs. The uplift model doesn't work out the way people hope. You know, the, the utopian hope is that the middle, the minute you get these lower middle class kids or minority kids into a fancy suburban school, that they will instantly be transformed. They'll start doing just as well academically. There won't be any discipline problems. There won't be any difference. Well, that is not the reality. But then the desire for equal opportunity transmogrifies into the demand for equal results. Yep. And how do we get equal results? Well, we have to relax the discipline standards. We have to relax the academic standards of, you know, white supremacy and privilege hoarding and all of this stuff. I mean, it just frictions, frictions emerge uh, and you expend a huge amount on keeping these schools together, keeping them stable because there's a lot of white flight and white flight isn't just for whites. I mean, the people who are dumping ship are upper middle class people who sure. don't like what's happening to their school. Including yeah. minority people. But, uh, let me, so here's how, uh, 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 of here, course, here's how a critic might respond. Um, you're saying, are you, that some mm -hmm. kids' backgrounds are broken and they need a school environment that counters that brokenness. They need the structure that they're not getting at home. Other kids who are privileged because their homes are more stable and more resource intensive and the parents mm -hmm. are more focused on the kids' education um, mm -hmm. are, are um, just by putting kids in the same building with these other kids doesn't mean that these uh, cultural uh, practices are going are gonna to take. And in fact, you're going to be dragging down uh, the kids who come from the more structured homes to integrate them. Better to not have class integration in the school, to have the disadvantaged kids over someplace where they can have their structural needs addressed, and to have the advantaged kids not uh, stymied or encumbered uh, by the presence of disadvantaged kids who are not really prepared to, uh, uh, you know, at the same uh, level to engage in the educational enterprise. It, 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 right. Well, that is that is my point. But I think the you know, the, the people who are pro income integration, they would deny that the um, upper middle class kids that they're using like pixie dust to sort of create this magic that they're harmed in any way. I think that that's, you know, debatable. That's very debatable. Uh, but it's really I'm not even focused on that. The, the possibility of dumbing down. I am focused on the, the tensions and the frictions that emerge because it doesn't work instantly as uh, represented and it creates a lot of resentment and frustration on the part of the people who think that by going to Scarsdale High, they will uh, be transformed. And that's unrealistic, as you suggest. Uh, and then, of course, as you say, the uh, denizens of Scarsdale, they're, they're going to get uh, they're going to have some sources of dissatisfaction too. So better to 
Um, you know, I don't think that segregation is good for its own sake. I'm not saying that at all. I'm asking what works? What is the better model that is more likely to be efficacious and uh, to minimize the amount of resentment, tension okay. that you get? So, so what, do you, what do you say to somebody who objects that you're putting all of the burden of adjusting to this integration problem on mm -hmm. the disadvantaged kids and that both the institution, the school, and the families of the advantaged kids, if we want integration to work, have to, have to give something. Schools have to rethink how they're organized, and the families of the advantaged kids have to be willing to uh, accept that uh, extending more equal opportunity to the disadvantaged is going to mean that maybe there won't be so many advanced placement or gifted and talented or uh, whatever that, but but that's the price of uh, creating within a school district a more equal, uh, uh, you know, yes. structure of opportunity for all the families. Right. Well, I think you know there are a lot of things to say to that, but one thing I would say is I don't think integration is actually accomplishing that goal. First of all, there is spontaneous integration across groups and across classes in, in many places in this country. Um, my son went to a high school, a local public high school that was 25% black. Uh, so these, it happens spontaneously. I, I think the problem comes when you're doing it by social engineering or expending resources and political capital to move kids around uh, like, kid, like pieces on a chessboard. And that uh, creates a lot of difficulty for parents um, a lot of backlash, a lot of resentment and disgruntlement. And I don't think it's worth it because I don't think the results uh, make it worth it. It's very anemic. The model doesn't produce what's promised from it. So you can say, well, white parents need to sacrifice. People need to give up something. Well, sure, but not for nothing. Uh, we'd like to see you know, some positive effects. I think integration, forced integration uh, in the 50s made sense to me. Uh, it was well-meaning and it made sense because we had a dual school district. We had black schools that were far inferior sure. in, in every respect, but things have changed. That is not so anymore, okay? Uh, they We have largely equalized funding. Minority districts spend a huge amount of money per pupil. Federal money has poured into these schools. Um, I don't think integration has the the punch that it had before. Uh, and where does this idea come from that we we cling to that we need white kids and preferably white upper middle class kids, you know, in order to make an institution channeling Clarence Thomas here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need to spread them around as one blogger said, like pixie dust. That's, that's what makes a school good. Well, why, why does it have to be that way? Uh, I think we need a new model, a new way of thinking about things that, um, and, and the other problem is that demographically, you know, whites are <laughs> not as plentiful as they used to be. I mean, in many places, Glenn, right. we're running out of whites to spread around. Uh, oh. So that is not going to be a viable model for a lot of places. T tell me what you think about this. Um, I, I hear you on what you're saying about uh, the problems with uh, with integration as a, a magic bullet that's going to fix everything. And mm -hmm. I think we have good reason to be doubtful about this, but, t but, but t about that. But tell me what you think of this. So one definition of equality uh, from the point of view, let's say, of a state's constitution that mandates that kids have to have right. equal opportunity is the equalization of expenditures across district lines. Right. Some districts have more property value taxable than others, and they can raise more money for their schools, but the state should disperse funds in such a way as to offset that so that roughly the districts are equal. So that's, the, that's my understanding, crudely put, of the guiding principle for equality in education. Sure. But a sure. person might say that's the wrong principle. Mm -hmm. Nominal equality of dollars per pupil is not the same thing as equal effective educational opportunity. If I have a community where there's a high out-of-wedlock birth rate, a high 
a free lunch uh, subscription rate. Uh, a lot of chaos going on outside, the e economic uncertainty, uh, crime, uh, all of this kind of stuff, drugs. If I have a community with a lot of single parents and stuff like that, well, those kids really, the same dollar doesn't give them the same educational opportunity. I ought to expect to be spending more. It's no surprise that inner city districts would be spending more per pupil than suburban districts. And they might not even so be getting the same equality of effective educational opportunity given the other things that are going on. What's wrong with a principle of equality of effective educational opportunity and with trying to implement that principle by spending what it takes to achieve effective educational opportunity, even if that means spending more on disadvantaged kids? I'm not against spending more. And in fact, we are spending more. We've had Title I. We've had, <laughs> Obama had a program for spread, spreading around extra funds uh, and spend uh, millions, tens of millions of districts that are under uh, achieving. Let me tell you why I think it really uh, pointless, because money is not the solution. Spending extra money uh, is not going to call it, solve the problem of, of these test score gaps, of, of skill gaps, of achievement gaps. Uh, I think we, we have fetishized resources, external resources. You know, John Ogbu, when he talked about Shaker Heights, he, he said, no, there's this notion abroad of the empty vessel. We can pour learning into you. We can pour achievement into you. We can buy some external manipulation just by putting enough resources and money and will behind it. We can make you learn and achieve. I just... I don't believe that. I think that is fundamentally misbegotten. And I'm not against equalizing funds. I'm not against spending more. I just don't think we're going to get the results that were out of that. And, of course, this is an obsession of the left. Uh, liberals are always talking about the next scheme to improve the schools, the new idea, uh, some other gimmick, some other tactic, but it's always something we're going to do to people, Glenn, rather than something that they're going to do for themselves. Uh, and I just don't think it works. However, I did endorse No Excuses Schools because that is truly something we're going to do to people, but we are going to do it with their full participation, active, agentic, participation and give them the message clearly uh, you are responsible uh, you are the ones you must do this for yourself we cannot do it for you and that's part of what I like about no excuses schools you know the culture of achievement versus the culture of agreement you're holding out on us it's white privilege it's something you're not doing for us you need to give us more yeah. You owe us it's helping right now in the present era, today, today. I'm not talking about the past. Obviously, Brown v. Board and all of the efforts to desegregate were necessary at the time, but I think they've kind of petered out. I teach these cases, and I have seen uh, you know, the failure at the end of the day of these efforts. I think you're putting your finger on something important when you talk about the difference between a passive and an active uh, mode in which we try to help people, by which I understand you to mean passive is they're taught and expect that somebody's going to come to the rescue, the world hasn't dealt them a fair hand, there does, there's nothing for them to do but to sit back and be made whole. And an active is that they're taught there's some things that you can do. If you do them, you've got a pretty good chance of succeeding. Here, let a me have a chance. Let me, let me help you and show you what it is that yeah. you need to do. And as you do it, you're going to acquire a sense of self-confidence and, and efficacy that will, hold, will uh, serve you well throughout your life. Come, let's go together and get this thing done. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this goes to my affirmative action piece, of course. Well, let's talk about that. Right yeah. Into it. yeah, let's talk yeah. about that because we've got a few minutes left here. Uh, well, I, I wrote an affirmative action piece. Uh, for a symposium, and I thought, 
gee, you know, I, I really think there are two very different attitudes about affirmative action that are out there. I mean, one that I grew up with, which is oh, we wouldn't dream of ourselves, uh, and one that thinks affirmative action is entirely appropriate. And affirmative action, whether you not, uh, it does involve a relaxation of standards. You know, there's this paradox in affirmative action. I was talking to a friend of mine about this. You're, if you're a good person and you're for racial justice, you are for affirmative action, and that's that. And you may not have another opinion. But yeah. on the other hand, if you dare to suggest that minorities are somehow less qualified or have you know less proficiency or less aptitude, you're a racist. Well, this was brought out in this incident where this Maryland professor was fired because he leaked some internal conversation about how the Hispanic students were. Yeah. We're not very good, but the program anyway. So yeah. you can't, you know, how can we hold these two contradictory ideas in our mind at the same time? Uh, so I talk in my article about not dreaming of affirmative action of the way I grew up. I grew up in this fairly insular Jewish community in upstate New York, and we were operating on two levels. On a high level, on an abstract level, we did recognize anti-Semitism. People didn't deny it. Absolutely. It was forthrightly acknowledged. Uh, but on the ground, if you ever tried to use anti-Semitism or discrimination as some kind of excuse or explanation for why you did poorly on a test or didn't achieve or couldn't meet the same standards as anybody else, well, that was unthinkable. You just didn't say that. I mean, you'd be laughed. They'd think that you had come down with some kind of mental illness. I mean, we just didn't translate anti-Semitism into... <laughs> You know, something that had to do with our daily lives and the standards that we were supposed to meet. Well, I, I just want to be clear that I understand. People in your uh, background, the Jewish uh, insular community in upstate New York, understood that anti-Semitism was an impediment, but had the, uh, the norm or the principle that it could never be used as an excuse. Notwithstanding the objective correctness of the observation that it's an impediment, we just take that for granted in our job as Jews, I speak now for you, and I, I don't have the, you know, I don't know what you're talking about for sure. I'm asking you, but our job as Jews is to get the job done, regardless of the fact that this impediment is there. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, actually, to, to work around it, to outfox it and outsmart it and just find a way. And, you know, it's interesting because justice has nothing to do with it. Really, justice has nothing to do with it. It's, it's really a whatever it takes mentality. Uh, and I, I don't want to sit here and compare the horrible treatment that blacks were subjected to to the treatment Jews were subjected not. to. We're not, we're not in a, a sweepstake here, uh, competition right. to try to figure out who's more oppressed. No, no. I, I acknowledge that, you know, what blacks endured is horrible. And I'm freshly horrified by it when I read about it. Yeah. OK, um, I'm only saying that. Now that things really have gotten better, and I really do believe that they have gotten better, yeah. any objective person, I think, would have to admit that. Yeah. Um, to, to continue to cite it as the reason why, you know, we're falling short in this respect to that, I, I just think at the end of the day, it's self-defeat. And, and the search for justice is laudable, but it, it gets in the way. I mean, success is the best revenge. You know, at some point, psychologically, you just have to forget about that stuff and, and move on. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I was taught to do. I was taught to just put one foot in front of the other and whatever effort it takes, that is the effort you will expend. And I don't want to hear about it. Well, you know, uh, it's another interesting point. I mean, it's not fair, but life is not fair. It's not fair. I grant you, it's not fair that you have to work harder than the other guy in order to get correct. the thing done. But life is not fair, and it's, as a matter of fact, if you work harder than the other guy, you can get the thing done, and that'll be the last. You'll have the last laugh, something like that. Right, it, or you will. Yeah, you will achieve. You you will achieve your goal, which is a better life, uh, success. I mean, not maybe the pinnacle of success, but how many people really get to the pinnacle of success, Glenn? I mean, only the only one percent of people can be in the top one yeah. percent. I think a lot of elites forget that. Yeah. You know, I'm 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 reviewing Richard Reed's dream workers, and it's like we all have percent. Well, Richard, we can't do that. That is not a viable blueprint for society. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, Amy, we can still have a good life.
And that, let me ask you this. Now, um, your views about affirmative action and mine are probably more similar than a lot of people might expect. But I have to tell you, I go into a classroom and I'm looking out at the students and some of them are African-American. Yes. And I want to say something like, if we have racially preferential admission standards, mm -hmm. then on average, the African-American students admitted under such a dispensation are less academically qualified by definition. Yes. And, and the kids who are looking back at me from the various seats around the room who are black are looking at me with a look in their faces that is saying, are you saying that I'm unqualified? Well, right. Now, now, now of course, mm -hmm. you and I and every statistician knows that I'm not saying that John Doe is unqualified. I'm saying that on average, the population of the people admitted under the special dispensation, by mm -hmm. definition, will have been admitted with less um, you know, impressive uh, academic credentials. That's what it means for them to have gotten preferential treatment. <clears throat> but the, the abstract statistical point, not you specifically, but the group to which you happen to belong, uh, right. somehow doesn't have a whole lot of force when you're looking that kid in the face. And the kid is saying, are you saying that we're unqualified and that we don't deserve to be here? How do you deal right. with that? Well, uh, like I go back to my point that we're supposed to hold these two completely incompatible ideas in our mind simultaneously. <laughs> we absolutely need affirmative action. Every good person is in favor of it, but blacks are just as qualified as everybody else on it. I mean, I don't know how we reconcile these two, but I think the way we reconcile them, Glenn, is that we have a wholesale assault on the idea of the meritocracy and this notion of qualification, we turn it into this protean manipulable thing. So we say, well, test scores don't mean anything. The usual criteria are biased. Uh, they favor the, the predominant culture to which I say, well, the predominant culture favors the predominant culture. I mean, we are culturally biased. Our culture is culturally biased. Uh, it's culturally biased in favor of people who can operate proficiently uh, in the culture. So what I would say to them is, well, I bite the bullet on this. I try to avoid the subject, as you can imagine. Um, I, I say, look, on average, you are less qualified. And that, in terms of your ability to compete on these narrow sets of, of skills that we value in academia, and we value them for functional reasons, because they enable people to Form the tasks, you know, function to to do the things that need to be done in society. I mean, take for example, I have a lot of relatives who are academic uh, physicians. You know, what it takes to be an academic physician in a complex field like oncology or cardiology. Yeah. I mean, it, it, hey, you know, you have to be smart. You have to be able to do math. You have to be able to organize a lot of information. I, there's no two ways around it, Glenn. And the people who assault the meritocracy, when they get sick, they get off their hobby horse and make a beeline for these people. Now, that's the truth. No, I know. All right. So there's <laughs> a lot of bad faith here. There's a lot of bad faith here. Um, but, yeah, the meritocracy, I, I don't think we should enshrine it as some kind of moral good necessarily. Uh, you know, we're not making a moral judgment here. We are making, I hope, a functional judgment uh, and then, we, of course, there is the downside of affirmative action, which is that we take these these perfectly uh, capable kids in the sense that they do have some skills because they wouldn't be able to get into a lot of competitive institutions and people who are more skilled, sometimes significantly more skilled. And then we ask them to compete. And that has to be demoralizing. It's got to be demoralizing. I mean, take, you know, Penn Law School or some top 10 law school. You know, here's a very inconvenient fact, Glenn. I, I don't think I've ever seen a black student graduate in the top quarter of the class and rarely, rarely in the top half. I can think of one or two students who've scored in the top half in my required first year course. Well, what are we supposed to do about that? That you're really, um, you're, you're putting in front of this person a real uphill battle. And if they were better matched, uh, it might be a better environment for them. That's the mismatch 
hypothesis, of course. We're not saying they shouldn't go to college. Uh, we're not saying that. Do you I have mean, some, um, of should, some of them should? Uh, do, you, do you have a racial diversity mandate for law review appointments at uh, Penn? Yes. Yes. So you're telling me that um, uh, students of color who have served on law review are uh, pretty much uh, uh, in the bottom half of their law classes at Penn? I, I would have to what I know. I mean, I haven't done a survey. I haven't done a systematic study. I'm, I'm talking about uh, yeah. who gets the honor. I have a big, you know, I have a class of 89, 95 students every year. So I see a big chunk of students every year. Uh, and I, so I, I, I'm going on that because a lot of this data is, of course, a, a closely guarded secret, as you can imagine. Sure. Let, let, let me tell you a story very briefly. Uh, years ago, I taught at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, we have professorial appointments, and in those years, they had uh, professor of practice appointments. Mm -hmm. So those were practitioners who had experience in public administration who come into the school as lecturers, not as professors. Right. Um, so uh, there was an affirmative action push and a person actually from the state of Pennsylvania who was uh, uh, like commissioner of public health for the state came to be interviewed for a job. He was an African-American and he gave a talk and the talk was not very polished by academic uh, presentation standards. You know, he tried to use data, but he wasn't very astute at his statistical analysis and he had a conceptual framework, but it wasn't all the I's dotted and T's crossed in the way that one would have wanted. It was very rough around the edges. On the other hand, he did have a lot of practical experience in managing a public health bureaucracy in a large state with big cities with uh, urban minority populations. And he had many interesting things to say, both about managing the bureaucracy and about setting goals and standards for public health in a big state. Now, our faculty uh, at that time, this is almost 30 years ago, agreed to hold its nose and offer this gentleman a job. That is, the conversation was he's not qualified, but he's black. We need blacks. Let's let's go with it. And I and I really felt disturbed by that conversation because my thought was, no, he's not qualified if the definition of merit in this case is polished academic presenter. But he certainly does bring some skills to the table that are virtually unknown in our school and that really might be thought of as expanding the definition of what we do. We might rethink our enterprise in light of the fact that we have brought this gentleman along. So the definition of qualification in that particular case, I thought, sure. ought to have been a little bit more malleable. And, and it seems to me that often affirmative action raises this kind of question. And some of the people are doing what you said, that is... They're trashing qualifications across the board because they're saying if we don't present them at the same rate, then they're not fair to us somehow. You right. know, they they yes. want to they want to rethink the definition of merit in in uh, in a, a tendentious way in order to serve their own um, uh, ethnic interests. But sometimes the definition of merit is worth rethinking because right. bus business as usual could be improved by the infusion of a of a different uh, way of defining problems and going about solving them. And I'm just wondering what you think about that, uh, or whether you think that has any, that kind of observation has any relevance in the discussion of diversity and affirmative action. I think it does. I mean, I, I think it is far from cut and dried and clear what sure. merit is or should be. And I think it absolutely, uh, you know, I'm I'm in academia, and I've in I was in appellate law for a long time. I was in the Justice Department and Solicitor General's office, and there the criteria are very, very exacting. They're very demanding. We're talking about a very, very high level of analytical skill uh, that is demanded and required and expected. And in that case, with that narrow set of requirements, or as you have in, you know, basic science departments or physics or math, I mean, there's very little wiggle room there. Uh, either you can do it or you can't. Yes. Uh, it's it's hard to say, and it needs to be. But you know, there are other roles in society uh, where merit or what people good at what they do or what means they can bring something to the table uh, is much more variable, much more subjective. You know, one of my friends is the wonderful Rusty Reno, who's the editor of First Things. I had lunch with him the other day and he said, you know, the good society, the decent society doesn't have just one set of, of desiderata or measures of what people can contribute 
And I agree with that. Uh, it, it's variable and we're constantly talking about, you know, what we're looking for, what we need. Uh, but whether we like it or not, going back to my first point, a certain kind of analytical cognitive proficiency is, uh, it's important. It's not the end all be all. It's not everything. But in our society, given what we, we've done, like the highly demanding, complex, uh, technological, sophisticated, have, which has so many benefits for people, has brought so much prosperity sure. and so many good things to life. I think if we sacrifice that too much, we're going to regret it. Yep. Uh, one more thing about it's a balance. It's a balance. I was just going yep. to bring up another issue about affirmative action that troubles me. I mean, you have made the observation that our, our ideas about meritocracy come under attack sometimes as people attempt to defend affirmative action. Right. I, I think our ideas about equality are, are also threatened in some ways by affirmative action. And here's what I mean. We say equality is the goal. We want more uh, students of color, disadvantaged students, uh, historically underrepresented students of color in these institutions in the interest of diversity, in the interest of promoting equality. And yet, and yet, if in fact the way that students of color are brought in are uh, under a, uh, a commonly known dispensation of having lower standards applied to them, it's, and, and if that has any implications for their performance after admission, I mean, the thing that you just got through saying to me is a startling thing. You've been at Penn for so many years, and you don't know if you can name a single uh, student of color who's been in the top a quarter. Or, I mean, this is a thing. So, so everybody can see this. It's not like people don't know that this is going on. It's not like the other students are not aware of the fact that these disparities are there. Uh, the kids know who's, quote, smart, close quote, who's, who are, you know, the people who are getting the right answers and who are stimulating other people. You know, they can see what's going on around themselves. So uh, you, you create a situation in which it becomes uh, uh, impossible to acknowledge a reality of which people are aware, in which that reality has a racialized hierarchy of performance on the average, of course, not applying to every single person, but nevertheless, um, and in which it's anything but equal. I mean, the, 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 the fact that you can bean count the heads on the law review and you get a proportion that's something like their representation by color in the student class, but that when, you, when, when, when people are asked to think about, you know, who were really the intellectual movers and shakers, they, they, they know that the minority students are, are virtually un unrepresented there. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's a horrible thing for yeah. uh, equality. For, for genuine equality, you, you get a, a kind of faux equality, a kind of patronizing yes. equality. People, you know, genuflect at the idea of equality, but deep down, you don't have real equality, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's right. But really, the capacity, Glenn, that people have to delude themselves under the pressure of, you know, sort of what's correct, what's politically correct, and what's acceptable never ceases to amaze me. So I think there are significant factions in, in these places that are really in denial, profoundly in denial, and they don't necessarily notice this stuff. There are other factions, though, of students who do notice it, and they know that it is rude, it is impolite, it is not acceptable talk about it. And what we have, I think, is a situation where if you do talk about it, you are in trouble. I mean, you are a bad person. Uh, I think that's part of, you know, why I'm a bad person. I remember being in a clerkship committee meeting a number of years ago, and, and one of the faculty members said, I'm very disturbed by the fact that no black students are getting clerkships. Uh, they're not getting these prestigious clerkships. Right. We, I, I think there's discrimination here. Right. And I said, uh, Professor so-and-so, until you show me a spreadsheet of the grades and records of all the black students that I, yeah. I am not going along with this project because there is no group that is more grade conscious in the entire known universe than judges, than federal judges, left, right, and center, okay? They are obsessed with it, class rank, GPA. Uh, I'm sorry, and that's the way it is. So this is not our fault. 
Uh, but I, I want to see the data. Well, just saying I want to see the data, that I was, you know, a racist. I was evil. I was a bad person. Yeah. Uh, you don't say that. You don't say that. Yeah. But I did shut it down. I, I did shut it down. Uh, I <laughs> All right, Amy, we, we've come full circle to you being yeah. a bad person again. That's where we started. Yeah, and along the way, we covered the education of the disadvantage and affirmative action <laughs> in higher education. I don't know what's left. Uh, very good talking to you. I appreciate you giving some time. And uh, we'll do it again uh, when uh, another controversy arises. <laughs> right. Any time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Amy. We have to talk about immigration. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. Soon. Well, I'm gonna it. So we can do episode three. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a, in a few months maybe, okay? Okay. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. All right.